Okay, welcome back. I hope you had some warm coffee and you feel all refreshed after this little break. Uh, we will now continue with uh, the panel. Next uh, is we'll, we will hear Kitty, uh, Maria Helga, and Christine Maria uh, talk again, and we will discuss the way forward, par parental needs, and actions within the Icelandic framework. I also want to let you know that we have, as we are streaming the whole uh, whole conference, the, um, we have around 300 people that have been dropping into the session and around 15 to 20 people that are viewing it uh, all together. So we are more than only here in this room. I just wanted to let you know. And these people will have a chance at the end of the sessions to, to ask questions and, and, and interact with us here today. So welcome again. And the floor is yours. So the way forward is quite simple. The way forward is to start looking outside of Iceland. Uh, and start listening to, for example, the United Nations. The United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child have issued recommendations to many of the countries that we compare ourselves to. I'm not going to read everything that is on all of these slides, but they are all saying comparable things that cases of medically unnecessary surgeries and other procedures on intersex children before they are able to provide their informed consent, which often entail irreversible consequences and can cause severe physical and psychological suffering and the lack of redress and compensation in such cases. This is echoed in, yeah, this is echoed in their uh, 47C recommendation, ensure that no one is subjected to. So this is being repeated again and again. In the UNCRC concluding uh, obvers observations for France, then we see the same, that a rights-based healthcare protocol for intersex children, ensuring that children and their parents are appropriately informed of all options, that children are involved in decision making, and that no child is subjected to unnecessary surgery or treatment. The UN Committee Against Torture, Cruel and Degrading and Inhumane Treatment echoes all of this in their um, concluding observations to Denmark in February 2016 that there are necessary legislative, administrative, and other measures, as Ruth was mentioning. Legislation is just the first step and the minimum standard. And we see it echoed in the UNCRC concluding observations on Denmark from the 26th of October, 2017. We like this date, it's Intersex Awareness Day that, again, ensure that no one is subjected to unnecessary medical or surgical treatment. It's the same just being said again and again, so I'll spare you um, putting up every UN recommendation on this issue that has come, because they're all saying the same thing. Because human rights are universal and it doesn't matter where you live. This applies to us all. <clears throat> there has been one recommendation made to Iceland from the United Nations on LGBTI issues ever. This is it. That the Iceland doesn't have a comprehensive legislation in place that protects the right of intersex people in terms of equality and non-discrimination. Because just enacting legislation that stops these medical treatments isn't enough. If we want to reach a place where everyone can be 
out and open about who they are if they choose, then we have to have mechanisms in place that protect them from discrimination, that ensure their equality in our society. So I'm not going to subject you to any more slides. I'm not a fan of slides. They're sometimes a helpful tool. But we basically have an action plan already put forward, set in place that the Icelandic government can look to and adopt the Parliamentary Assembly's intersex resolution from October 2017. We can look to ILGA Europe um, because every year they publish the ILGA Europe rainbow map. Every year they look at the legal situation for LGBTI people in Europe. And there they cover some of the necessary legislative changes that need to happen for Iceland to reach a place where the rights of all LGBTI people are respected. Currently, Iceland has about 49%. 47. 47%. Percent. Oh, if only we had 49. <laughs> 47% of the legal protections needed to call Icelandic, Iceland a safe, secure, and equal place for all LGBTI people. 47% puts us in the same place as Greece. Greece is a country that does not have marriage equality like Iceland, but they do have anti-discrimination legislation that covers sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics. In Iceland, that doesn't exist. Even if you're lesbian, gay, or bisexual, you're not protected from being terminated from your employment. And for intersex people, nothing exists. The only references that we have to LGBTI equality and anti-discrimination in Iceland is goods and services for uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. There is a mention of sexual orientation in legislation that relates to schools. And that's about it. Apart from that, we have other grounds in the Constitution, which is a very open uh, term and which means that, for example, there's no equality body in Iceland that is charged with um, handling cases of discrimination against LGBTI persons. And uh, this means that um, if you find yourself subject to a human rights violation and, and uh, you find yourself subject to discrimination, then the process for um, seeking your rights in the society is long, complicated, and you know, not for the faint of heart. So we have a lot to do both in improving the legal framework and also in ensuring that the rights that we do have protected by law can actually be effectively enforced. The Icelandic government stated in their coalition agreement that they wanted to take Iceland to the front of the pack when it came to LGBTI rights. Still, we've seen two anti-discrimination bills being put forward. One of them does cover, and is in the field of employment, does cover sexual orientation and gender identity. But despite Iceland accepting the concluding recommendations from the United Nations in the Universal Periodic Review, they found it too challenging to add the grounds of sex characteristics to that legislation. Despite uh, there obviously being an immense lack of protection for all queer people in Iceland and a general anti-discrimination bill on the basis of um, ethnicity, ethnicity and, and national, origin. national origin being put forward. It was too challenging to just add the grounds that need to be added for this legislation to cover intersex people in the case of the field of employment, and all LGBTI people 
in the case of general anti-discrimination. And to, to expand on that a little bit, both of these bills are based on um, instructions received by the Icelandic government, I believe, now 18 years ago. Um, and despite the fact that we have 18 years of further experience and knowledge and understanding of the discrimination that takes place in our society, um, the government's rationale seems to be that no, we have to uh, we have to adopt these uh, their their EEA recommendations um, as they were set forward almost two decades ago. So we're going to start with that, and then we can add these other things later. But first, we have to do what the letter of the recommendation said. And I'm not a I'm not a legislator, but to me that rationale doesn't hold up. If you meet the minimum requirements. Why should you stop there? Why should you stop there when you know what the right thing is and all it takes is a few strokes of a pen to do it? So even though words were put on paper in the government coalition agreement, we question whether this will be followed through on. It's very easy to write five sentences on a piece of paper. But as has been shown with um, the LGBTI action plan, that they start, okay, I can't even remember what year that was, 2014 or 13? I think 13. Yeah, so I came in 2014 and then they've been working for a while. So a group started working on the LGBTI action plan in 2013. We still haven't seen it. We know that a lot of work has been put into it. It was supposed to be coming out in 2000, late 2014. And then 15. And, and then, then 16. 16. And then 17. And now it's 2018. And we still haven't seen the actual thing. And like so many things in government, this is a question of priorities. This I'm sure there's no one in the government who's actively trying to suppress or prevent this work from being completed but it's being put on a back burner. Completely. For years and decades. It's about political will. It's about policymakers just deciding, okay, this is something we are going to work on. And despite Iceland often being painted as a utopia for human rights and equality, equality. and all these issues, I mean, we made the news when we legislated equal pay for men and women, then... We went viral. We and went viral. <laughs> <laughs> then we still... There we see how easy it can be for the Icelandic government if there is enough political will. Because that was not legislation that had been worked on within a ministry for 18 years. That was legislation that was just put forward and adopted in a very brief time. So here we're talking about political will. And we know that there are politicians in Iceland who hold immense political will. But we also know that there are too many politicians in Iceland who go, yes, of course, we should do something about queer issues. And then one year later, yes, of course, we should do something about queer issues. And then a year later, well, yes, of course, we should be, well. And then they come to meetings at our organization and are aghast that we should have barely enough funding to have one and a half paid employees. <laughs> and uh, wonder why that is and think it's terrible, but still, again and again, well, the, same, the same prioritization means that the same situation persists. So we did invite every member of parliament to this symposium. Yes. And are very grateful that Hannah Katrin could find the time to join us until the end of the previous panel. So, our question to policymakers is, are they just going to keep talking about action? Are they just going to keep saying that things need to change and agreeing with us that when we paint the picture for them? 
Or are we going to keep falling further and further and further down the Olga Europe rainbow map, which is the best indicator in Europe for legal protections for LGBTI people? We need government commitment to take this and move it forward because we have degrading legislation for trans people in Iceland where they are forced to have 12 months of real life experience before accident. No, the, the legislation. legislation. That's exactly what it says in the law. We're very grateful that practices have shifted, but the practices are not in accordance with the legal framework. Yeah, technically, like, I'll, I was going to get to that. <laughs> so the legislation says that you need 12 months of real life experience before you can access hormones. Our medical professionals have realized that this isn't really acceptable anymore, so technically they're breaking the law. So they're basically doing what they believe is right and they have to do, despite it not being in accordance with the law. So there we see, on trans issues at least, that the medical field is actually some steps ahead of the legislator. That's an issue that, I will just say again, is just a lack of political will. Nobody disagrees with the fact that the trans legislation should be changed because the people who are working under it aren't anymore. So, we'll be sending each and every member of parliament, the parliamentary assembly's resolution on intersex issues, the amnesty report, information about the Maltese legislation, the entire recording of this entire event. And then we will be seeking out with our forming allyships with, for example, amnesty, for example, other local NGOs and civil society organizations that we work with and connect to, to push forward change. But we also need society to just stand up and go, what are you doing? Why is this taking so long? It's 2018. And it doesn't need to take this long. I mean, we're fortunate in that so much work has been done um, in the countries around us and by international bodies and organizations. And the knowledge is there. We just have to take it and apply it and complete a very clear set of tasks that's in front of us in order to rectify this legal situation. And it, doesn't ha it shouldn't have to take forever. It's not that long of a process. It just needs to be done. And let's hope it doesn't take forever. Um, as we have a parent here with us, we'd like to invite you to tell us what you believe that we need. Uh, I'm not talking about politics or like she's... That's the other. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to share my dream with you. I have a dream for future intersex children. When an intersex child is born, it will be welcomed by all. When med the medical profession will stop looking at it as a medical emergency. The parents will get the support to be able to understand and support their child. The parent will have a chance to meet other parents. The parents and the child will have a chance to meet other intersex people grown-up people so they can see we are normal. The people working in health sector will be educated about intersex. Teachers from kindergarten and up will be educated about intersex. That there will be no unnecessary medical treatments and surgery of intersex children without their fully Con informed consent, and I said fully informed consent. Thank you.
but to take a dream and make it reality, it's not enough just to say these words. And we as just regular citizens can't change what needs to be changed to make this dream a reality. We will need support from those who can actually put these changes forward, who can then implement these changes, and who can then make sure that these things aren't happening anymore here. There is only one body in Iceland who is responsible for that um, when it comes to almost everything in these dreams except for education, and that is the Icelandic government. And again, and I don't think I can say this enough, here we need to see clear actions that there is political will in Iceland to uphold the government coalition agreement and take our country to the front of the pack. And while there are certain things that obviously must stop and should have been stopped a long time ago in the way that um, our society and our medical system responds to uh, the birth of an intersex individual, uh, there are other things that need to start. Um, and first and foremost, we need to start providing the psychosocial support that uh, people need, uh, both intersex individuals and their families. And we need to provide education to the general public and to anyone who works uh, with, with children or in any medical field uh, to ensure that adequate knowledge is available. And for way too long, uh, this, um, the existence of intersex people, the existence of variations in sex characteristics within humanity has been addressed by surgical removal of that variability or attempts at surgical removal. Um, but you don't cut the, ch the child you're afraid that will be bullied to prevent them from being bullied. You don't, you don't take the victim of social problems and address those problems by trying to change the person who's the target of them. We change the culture. We address bullying as bullying, not as a problem with a child's body, but as a problem with the attitudes that that body faces. And that is something that needs to start yesterday, if not sooner. It's not enough just to enact legislation or enact an action plan or anything like that. We see this, for example, in Croatia, where LGBTI legal rights are much higher than here in Iceland. They're not implemented so fully, so they're not really in practice. They're words on paper, not action. So other than the legislative bodies, we also need to see psychologists step up and educate themselves. We need to educate even more uh, school staff than we already do. Um, our educational officer at S78 has educated school personnel in the entire municipality of Hapnabjörður about sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, sex characteristics and this sort of sex binary system and what it means in practice for everyday people. We have educated a lot of children in Reykjavik about these things but Again, with Reykjavik City, we see a lack of political will to enforce that what Reykjavik City has said, that teachers must also be educated. It's left entirely up to the schools. 
So we need the municipalities to step up and change what is happening in their domain, especially when it comes to education. Yes, we have a ministry for education, but in practice, most of that work takes place within the municipalities. We need to be able to provide support services for parents. Like I mentioned before, the latest media report that we've seen was that a young parent was sent home alone for nine months. In my mind, that's torture. In my mind, no parent should be subjected to that. Because it really isn't just about us as intersex people. It's also what our parents are being put through. They are made to consent without having information. So they will then take on a personal responsibility often if anything goes wrong. Studies have shown that parental consent is easily swayed. A study in Zurich University um, performed in 2013 called Shaping Parents showed the contrasting effect of different advice uh, that parents were given. If they were introduced to um, intersex issues from a demedicalized social point of view by watching information put forward by a psychologist, 23% of parents in that study would have chosen a surgical intervention or medical intervention for their child. However, the group of parents that was made to watch medicalized information, that number shot up to over 60%. So whenever somebody tells me that, oh, this is what parents want, I ask, so what did you tell them to make them want this? Because parents will listen to the advice that they are given. In this study, they were made to watch a 10 minute video about this, these issues. I'm sure you were subjected to much more than 10 minutes of medicalized information when, I, when you were made to consent. Yes. <laughs> so there we see sort of that if the only information that parents are provided with is medicalized, is pathologized, is telling them that, well, your child is disordered, your child is sick, your child needs treatment, of course they are going to consent. As a parent myself, I've walked into a doctor's office demanding a medical treatment for my child because three doctors had told me that my child needed a medical treatment. I'm not going to go into what it was, that doesn't matter. The fourth doctor I said when, that's not correct. You just need to do things a little bit differently, so I'm going to teach you how to do that. So, as a parent of a child who has been the parent who walked up to a doctor and said, do this to my child because I've been told three times already that they need this. I understand where a parent is coming from after having been told again and again that there's something wrong with their child and that that something needs to be fixed. Because every parent wants to do the best thing for their child. Well, most parents want to do the best thing for their child. But if they are not provided with the information that they need to make these decisions, then we're placing them into 
a place where they shouldn't be, where they shouldn't be forced to be. We're placing them into the position of making uninformed choices for their children's bodies. With all the guilt that that can bring at a later date. So, any questions? <laughs> Or social work, or psychology, or... The question is whether this is addressed at all within university education here in fields like uh, social work or psychology or education. Um, so for the last few years, we've provided education to medical students because they request us. They have this week where they focus on sort of the um, Medical Students Association ranges this week of education, which is diverse. So we educate them. We've educated social workers um, that work in schools in Hapna Fjordur municipality. We've educated teachers uh, in Hapna Fjordur municipality and some teachers here in Reykjavik. Mm -hmm. But it always depends on if it is, it's always sort of comes from the group or the person themselves that they reach out and ask for it. Um, we have provided some information to counselors at S78 uh, throughout the years. Um, and with their already understanding gender identity and sexual orientation issues, it's much less of a leap, maybe for them. But if we just look at LGBT people and counseling needs, then within S78, we've seen a huge increase. There are needs that aren't being met. And this applies to intersex people as well. Like, there are very limited options to seek assistance like this from sort of somebody who actually just gets it where you don't have to start by explaining yourself, where you don't have to start by educating, where you don't have to start by like telling them what the issues be that are being faced are, where you can just start the first session talking about the actual issue you came to see that person about. And also referring back to the question about uh, university education, as you can hear from, uh, from Kitty's answer, um, the education that is being provided is provided by um, NGOs coming in for like a single session on request. Um, these are not, this is not a part of um, formally established curricula and kind of integrated reliably into the formal education that people in these professions are receiving. It's dependent on individual will and on the resources of NGOs that um, are always understaffed, always running on volunteer energy and may or may not at any given time have the capacity to provide this kind of educational support. So there's a real need for uh, curricular change and for additional resources to the NGOs that are doing this work. And there's just a real change for the political system to start backing this up, to start providing the funding that is needed. I mean, within S78, our counselor, the counseling service there, they could be called almost volunteers because what they can be paid is only a fraction of what a psychologist in private practice would be paid. So it's very safe to say that all advances that have been made on any LGBTI issue in Iceland has come from the grassroots, has come from people who just have tirelessly dedicated themselves to changing things here. 
And even though it's not visible in legislation, perhaps, it is visible in society. I mean, okay, <clears throat> this isn't the best sort of barometer, but it is still an impressive one. If the weather is super nice and there's nothing too important else on that weekend, up to a third of our country's population will show up to Pride. If the weather is nice. <laughs> <laughs> the weather's less nice is more like a fifth. Yeah, but still. Um, there's a Facebook group called Hinsenleikin, which could sort of translate to queer everyday life. No, Hinsein Spjatli, which could translate to um, Queer Chat, which has 2,300 members. There's a Snapchat channel called Hinsein Lekin, which is sort of queer everyday life, which at least in 2016 was followed by 5% of the country's population. The last estimate I heard was that it was getting closer to 10%. These are societal changes that have been made and we do still have hate speech to LGBTI people we do have hate crime towards LGBTI people but because there's no legislation on hate crime in Iceland then it's never recorded as hate crime um, it's just recorded as a violent act without regards to its motivation um, yeah, the queer activists of Iceland have changed the society and the legislator has just fallen far, far, far behind. Because marriage equality was enacted in Iceland, it was sort of, that's enough. At least that's what it looks from the activist side of things. I think there was another question, wasn't there? Second. Like to introduce myself. My name is Alex Stavrosan. Uh, I was last week a deputy from the deputy for parliament for the Labour Party. Uh, and you were talking about uh, the need of uh, like a uh, holistic or like a uh, whole uh, ensuring the rights of the LGBTI community. obvious for me stepping into the first week in parliament because we had a discussion about the name Alex the girl who wasn't allowed to be named Alex and uh, I had to speak there about this committee the two naming committee of Iceland such very Soviet politics we have here and in 2018 we had a committee that decide what is the correct gender now we are up for a way in this dialogue or in responses to the majority of the human rights of all the variety of the gender in general that, that we have a committee co like deciding what is the correct gender for names so I guess that was my yeah just one of the things you can't even control what you're named so I think that's the thing. and my question is Talking about the, the bill that was supposed to uh, give results uh, in 2018, but was postponed in 2014, and uh, do they have? Are they making a set of uh, recommendations for the? If you put the word over it, you're talking about ways that we can implement, or the, or the making the implements. It's supposed to be an action plan. I'll get our action. It's supposed to be an action. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's taken five years to make the action plan. Uh, even though the action plan was supposed to be based on the rainbow map, which is, um, it doesn't take very long to look at the rainbow map, read through the index, read through the discussion of the situation in Iceland, and figure out where the dots are missing. So. Give it to us and we'll have it done in a week. <laughs> if we can take that week off from our real jobs. Then yeah, 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 of course. 
I think I would just like to thank you for the input of this time for uh, session. So I would like to also invite uh, Laura, Pierre, and Ruth to join us to the panel so we can have a, a discussion of the faith.